Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of machine learning in production. In the first part, I explained to you about bringing raw data, pre processing your raw data, and also feature engineering, which is very important. Go and watch the first video if you haven't watched it already. I will put a link in the description. I have a separate video about categorical encoding. In the feature engineering part, I talked about the scale normalization and why it may not be necessary if you are using tree based model. All right. Now, in this part, which is the most important part, I'm going to talk about the training of the machine learning model as well as MLOP is concerned. I have another video after that is about prediction and uh, monitoring. All right, so let's get to this video. So, in order to train machine learning model and deploy it to production, in order to do it correctly, you need to consider four very, very important questions. One, what is the right tool for my uh, model? Two, What's the right model? Three, what are the, the, how can I choose the best hyperparameter? Four, where to store them? Guys, remember, in the production environment, in the large scale, you are not going to have train and test all at the same time. Or there might be a failure in training, or you want to do training and testing at a different point in time. There must be a way to store the hyperparameter, right? It's not a school environment, the data is in a CSV file, a, a small scale data, Every time you feed the train, and then you feed the, you feed the model to the data, and you train the data and model, and then you test it right after that. You need to be able to pull the best hyperparameter. Right? That's very, very important. So you need to have a place to store your hyperparameter. All right, so let's start. First, I'm going to talk about choosing the right tool. And then after that, model or hyperparameter, and then that's your story. All right, when you are choosing the right tool, there are all kind of coupled together. When you are choosing the right tool, it means that what tools you want to use to train your machine learning model. I'm not talking about the package here. I'm talking about the tool, right? So, for example, depends on the size of the data, depends on the size, you have to ask yourself, hey, can I fit my entire data into memory? If I can, then the tool that I'm going to use is going to be Python. As simple as that. Remember, Python is a um, very good language with lots and lots of library. Perhaps it's the most widely used uh, package for the library for the or program language for the uh, machine learning and AI by far. The problem here is that Python is very slow and also is in, in memory, uh, does in memory operation. So if you cannot fit the data into memory, then you either have to use some tricks, maybe batch processing, maybe you have to use a generator whatsoever. But maybe Python is not a good tool for your um, application. In that case, if you cannot really, uh, don't have enough memory, depends on the budget that you have, then you have to use PyStorm. In memory, or you can use PyStorm, which is a lazy distributed training. Right. So, this is solely if you want to decide this one, it's based on the size of the cluster that you have. If you have enough budget, you can consider the cost uh, for your application. If you can fit it into memory, Python. If not, uh, PySwap. So, uh, I will talk a little bit more about that in the uh, right model. I can have a separate video about each of these. Here, I'm just touching the surface. If you have a question, please. Uh, leave a comment under my video. I can write a lot about any of these. I can talk a lot. I can talk about this perhaps for a day, right? Uh, I will touch this one also in, in choosing a right model because there is much more than size of a data model. You need to consider a lot of things. How advanced is your model actually? How advanced is your application? But for now, we're gonna leave the choosing the right tool. Either it's gonna be Python or PySquare, okay? We are not gonna, in the production, we perhaps do not use R, right? I in, my experience that I work with different tools, I've never used R in production. I've used R a lot in research, but not in production. Because usually you work with the software engineers as well, and they don't really use R. They are mainly familiar with Python. All right, so that's this. Now we go to choosing the right model. Now choosing the right model depends on a uh, couple of factors. One of them is that uh, the type of application. Right. 
the type of application. What sort of application I'm trying to solve? What sort of problem I'm trying to solve? Application or problem. Right? It's very, very important to consider this one. Let me elaborate on that. Is the problem, this is what it means. Is the problem going to be uh, what sort of data I have? Type of application or type of data? You ask yourself, is my problem time series forecasting? Do I want to forecast the weather that is naturally a time series? Do I want to forecast the stock market? Or is it like a tabular data type problem? Like a standard cross-sectional data problem? So you ask yourself, is it cross-sectional? The data. Or panel? Or time series data? That's the first question you ask. Based on that, the model is going to be different. If you're using a cross-sectional, you can use tree-based models. You can use neural network ones. If you're using the um, time series data, perhaps you want to use RIMA. You want to use Fort. You want to use Winter, Fort Winter. You want to use, I don't know, RIMA X, Sarima. You want to use deep learning-based models. If it's a long horizon time series forecasting. If it's a uh, immediate time series forecasting problem with more like a prediction, if it's like more like a classical machine learning model, you can use also tree based model or any machine learning model. But then, for to answer this question, choosing the right model, you need to see what type of data you have available and also what sort of application you have in mind. Now, again, more about type of data. What sort of data I have available besides what I want to forecast? Let's say I want to forecast uh, the price of an uh, item. What other data I have? Do I have some sort of access to the static or categorical data? Well, if that's the case, I can use RIMA. RIMA is a univariate, remember? RIMA is a univariate model. So perhaps I, I may not be able to use the, if it's a long horizon time series forecasting, I cannot be able to use any classical model. Then my best bet is to use is, uh, we call it neural network type models or transform based models. All right? So that's actually very important, choosing the uh, right model. Another thing that you need to consider is that the complexity. Model. You see, is, um, the question here is that you're working a large scale environment. You have lots of lots of data. You want to choose a model that is relatively fast and also accurate. Okay? So, in that case, you have to ask yourself, okay, I'm doing, let's say, uh, processing large, large volume of data. Do I want to use deep learning? Do I have access to GPU? If not, perhaps I don't want to use deep learning. Maybe I want to use tree based models. Now, if a speed is really concerned, do I want to use XGBoost, that is a relatively slow uh, model compared to like using a or chat boost? So these are all the questions that you have to ask yourself in the MLOps. I will have a separate video about all of them. But please do write a comment under my video, which I see which part you want to know more about them. All right? So in a sense, you need to understand what complexity of the model. Another thing you need to consider is depends on your application and depends on the stakeholder you, you need to ask yourself, all right, I have all this stuff. This is great. What about the accuracy? How much accuracy I want to get out of my model? Right. How much stability I want to get out of my model? So it's kind of the way you can have final study and study. Right. Okay. So how much accuracy you want to get of your model? How much bias you can accept at the cost of a given test? Do I want to use backlog? Do I want to use boosting? If I want to reduce the variance, perhaps I want to use a model like random forest. If I want to use, reduce the bias, perhaps XGBoost or my GBM or my tree based models. All right? How sensitive uh, I want, I think my model is to the data. Maybe I want to uh, try deep learning based models. And all sorts of questions that you need to be able to answer in order to choose the right model. Now, I told you when I was talking about the choosing right tool, I said I'm going to talk more about that when I talk about the choosing the right model. Now, something that is very important when you choose the right model is that you need to consider that what the availability of the packages. So, this is very, very important in a lot of uh, production environments or a lot of products. 
You don't want to spend so much time finding the uh, writing a package from scratch or inventing a bit from scratch. So one thing that is very important here is the availability of open source packages. Open source. So of course all the companies have their own tools if they have them released that is not useful for them. Open source packages. Can we really talk about Python? What is popular? Now it's here. In Python, you can use a scale down, for example. You can use PyTorch. You can use TensorFlow. You can use, um, I don't know, um, Pandas, for example. And so on and so forth. Right. There are different packages that you can use. This is for Python. Now, if you cannot fit your data into memory using the right model, you have to use PySwap. Well, we talk about that here. And then choosing the right model in PySwap is a little bit tricky. Why? Because the availability of the PySwap packages is very, very limited. Right? This is something that I want you guys to understand. When you want to use PySwap in a production environment, you need to use MLD, Machine Learning Library for PySwap. This is very, very basic compared to scikit learn. Extremely basic compared to scikit learn. Extremely, extremely basic support for deep learning. All right? So many would have an issue here. The feature engineer part is very basic. You can do feature engineering in Python, bring it to PySpot, I will do how. I have several videos about that. But this is something to consider about choosing the right model when you are choosing the right tool. If you can do everything to avoid PySpot, go ahead and do that. Because PySpot is very basic. But uh, MLE has support for uh, gradients, booster trees, random forest, linear regression, and some other models. You can also use XGBoost, which is a library both written for Python and the uh, PySwap, XGBoost library, both of them for Python, PySwap, very similar interface. Or you can use Synapse ML. Synapse. Synapse ML. Right, which is a little created for, by Microsoft and it's really good for the light UVM. Alright? But it's extremely basic compared to scikit learn so don't get your hope up. Alright? So when you're choosing the right model, remember the right tool also is very important. If you decide to use PySwap, your choices are very limited here. You don't have the option that uh, Python has, all right? So that's something to consider. That. All right, so, so let's say you chose the right model for your problem based on your application, based on the type of data you have. Now you need to, you have a model, you have a data. You need to find the best hyperparameter for your model. All right, well, don't expect that the, the, the um, default hyperparameter works very well for your application. For every data that you have, you need to tune your hyperparameters. All right, so let's talk about that. I have a feeling that based on the companies that I've been, most of them have problems here. They don't really know how to tune the hyperparameter. So let's talk about this. Okay. Alright, so choosing the best hyperparameter. So the question is that. How can I choose the best hyperparameter? You usually have a loss function, and based on that, you use a great, some sort of gradient descent to go through the local minimum, or to go through the um, gradient asset to go through the local maximum, right? So for loss function, you usually want to minimize that, so you go through the local minimum. But you have to have a way to systematically reduce the loss function, and that's the part of the uh, choosing the hyper best hyperparameter. Now, there are different ways to do this. One is doing search. One is random search. One is Optuna. And one is Hyper. Let's talk about that. Grid search and uh, random search, they are part of the scalar library. And these two are different libraries, right? They are the 
paysan. Pas dommage de ça. Grid search will consider also all different possibilities that you have. Every single possibility. Let's say that you have five different choices for number of estimators. Let's say you have like x equals three different choices for the learning rate and three different choices for the max max steps. Three times three, three nine times five, forty-five. You have forty-five different possibilities. If I'm on the size of theta, you might take forever. You might take six hours, seven hours. Grid search is the most is the most expensive If you want my opinion, never use research. search. Now, random search come here and say that, you know what, you have five different choices of hyperparameters, choose two of them from the number of estimators, choose two from uh, learning rate, choose two from the um, max step, two times two, four times five, 20, right? Reduces the complexity of the research, but the problem is that it misses sometimes the best hyperparameter. Uh, let's Expressive. Thank you, research. But may miss the optimal hyperparameter. Yes. Okay. Now we go to the North star of two and a half hours, both of them are amazing. Use these two from this one now, right? I have used all these four. I have benchmarked lots of lots of data, lots of lots of modern data. I don't have any reason to prefer the research over up to and a half hours. I have absolutely no reason to tell you why the research is better than this two. This two by far better than uh, research. And um, of course, the uh, random search. All right. So what here is going on here is that these two, they are fast, optimal search, and more accurate than the research. Okay. Now, which one is better? I think Optuna has more features as of now. Optuna has more features and more, uh, you have more freedom to actually choose a hyper parameter. That's my choice. I've used both of them, I have no problem with either. But both of them are fantastic tools, right? Now, another thing, what if your application is deep learning? You cannot really use grid search, because grid search is for scikit learn, right? Grid search is specifically written for scikit learn. So if you're using deep learning, you cannot, really, you can make it work, but it's really hard. You cannot really use grid search or random search. Then you have to use Optuna and hyper. If you have the learning this model, what if you want to use PySpark? Actually, PySpark has a support for both grid search and random. I, I didn't have the uh, research. The MLD library, uh, the part of the Spark, uh, it has the grid search itself. But then you can use HyperOpt for the PySpark. I think you can also make Optuna to work for uh, PySpark as well. So in that case, you wouldn't really have any problem. So what's the takeaway from this point on? Use Optuna and HyperOpt for your hyperparameters to Never use the search on random search. And they are also very easy to use. Use a loss function, it's where you define a loss function, and then you choose a better hyperparameter space, and then you let the model do the package to the rest. All right? So that's it. Now, so let's say I chose the best hyperparameters. So now I have to do train the model. With the best hyperparameters, I go ahead and train the model. This is good. I have the train model. But then what do I do next? In the production environment, don't expect the training and testing happen at the same time. Maybe I want to train today, I want to trust tomorrow. Maybe my model for what model is not paying. I want to choose the best hyperparameter and then test it later on, predict it later on. So you need to have a place to store your hyperparameters. Now let's talk about the most important part. Okay. So Storing hyperparameters. And more. All right, so it's very, very important. Where do I want to store hyperparameters and models? You have a couple of options. You can use tensor. 
You can use TensorFlow for that. For TensorFlow, you can look at the plots, you can look at the loss function, you can look at the plot of loss function as a function of epoch, you can look at the best hyperparameters, or you can use MLflow. Which one is better? MLflow by far. Hands down, MLflow is the best here. MLflow is written by, is developed by the same company like Databricks, or like created this uh, Spark uh, type application. Um, Databricks is actually a pretty good company. If you, I don't know if you guys ever, ever use Databricks, it has a pretty nice uh, base local waste model that you can actually use for SQL, Python. It has a Scala, PySpark, it has an R support. So it's actually pretty good. It's very similar to what Google Collab or what SageMaker does, but it's actually for larger scale application. Because by default, SageMaker doesn't support uh, Spark. So you have to use EMR for that. Databricks has that one. It has some problem compared to SageMaker. But if you are looking for a large data or big data, Databricks is by far the best. So now, MLflow is a way you can store hyperparameters. It's very, very simple. You import MLflow, and then uh, any hyperparameter you want to save, you just type MLflow.log. What do you have to save? You need to save best hyperparameters. Save train model. So this can be either or. You can either save train model or save base hyperparameters. If I were you, I would choose the best hyperparameters. Because you can later on define a uh, new model and then load your hyper best hyperparameters into the uh, the, the new model during the testing. All right, so that's where you you should actually store your hyperparameters. And the fellow has a functionality you can look at the loss function. You can save pretty much anything. You can also look at the chart. They recently add the functionality to you. You can look at the plot uh, of loss versus epoch. And several so more used to have this one. And the did not, but not even though even does have that. Okay, so that's the um, storing the hyperparameters. The next part that is also very important is the infrastructure, which I leave it to the next video. What infrastructure you want to use for training or in general for testing or prediction? We are going to talk about the Collab, SageMaker, EMR, Databricks, and pros and cons of each one. So I will leave this one for the uh, future videos. This is, that's it for uh, this video. I think it's actually getting a very long video. So I talked about a couple of very important uh, topics. I can go into very detail about each one. Maybe each one I can break into five or six videos. But leave, uh, let me know which one you need uh, more help, or you need more video or more tutorial. Leave a comment under my video, and I do my best to post more video and answer your question in detail. Thanks, and see you all.